Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Treating people right is one of the reasons why you get blessed. When you mistreat people, you're not going to have the blessings of God on your life. Well, before we actually get into today's teaching, which I believe is going to be wonderful, there's something that I'd like to share with you that's been on my heart recently. You know, on our program, I don't say that much about giving because to be honest with you, I know that many times people have a mindset that people like me are just trying to get their money and I don't ever want anybody to think that. But recently, God has been really dealing with me that I'm not doing you a favor if I don't teach you how to give how to be a giver. And it's not really about, at this point, I'm not talking about who you give to. I just want you to understand the importance of being a giver because really it's one of the things that has radically changed my life and it's such a foundation of our biblical principles that I just don't feel like I'd be doing you justice if I just continue to not really teach in that area. So first of all, John 3.16 says, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. I love to think about that God gave the most valuable thing that he had. He gave his only Acts 10.38 says, See how God anointed and consecrated Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with strength and ability and power, and how he went about doing good, giving, and in particular curing all who were harassed and oppressed by the power of the devil for God was with him. Well, we're encouraged in the Word of God to be Christ-like, to develop the character of God. So how can we say that we've become Christ-like if we don't learn the value of giving? You know, one of the things that we have to get beyond is selfish, self-centered, what-about-me living. We sure love it when somebody else does something for us, but we need to realize that it is more blessed to give than to receive according to the Word of God. Now, there are some wonderful promises for you attached to giving. God doesn't really need our money. We need to give. Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and gifts will be given unto you. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will they pour into the pouch formed by the bosom of your robe and used as a bag. That's the amplified, kind of long, but for with the measure that you deal out, with the measure you use, when you confer benefits on others, it will be measured back to you again. So what's that saying? It's basically saying the same way you give, that's how you're going to receive. Kind of gets us back to what we call the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, I can honestly tell you, that if you have a problem in your life right now and you need a breakthrough, you need a harvest, you need a miracle, one of the best things that you can do is reach out to somebody else in their need, in their pain. And one of the ways that you can do that is through some kind of giving. You may give time, it may be finances, it may be some service to someone else, but you need to be a giver. Now, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 10 is what I'm going to conclude this little mini teaching with today. But it's so powerful. It says, remember this. You know, I think when God tells me to remember something, that I should remember it. He who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. So it's not just about sowing, but it's the attitude we sow with. And he who sows generously, and that blessings may come to someone, will reap generously and with blessings. So not only do I want to teach you to give, but I want to teach you to give with a right motive. Why do we give? We give that someone else might be blessed. I think we know that we've had a major change in our lives, that our hearts have really been changed when we really want to make other people happy. And so then it goes on to say, let us give as we have purposed in our own mind and in our heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion, for God loves, he takes pleasure and he prizes above other things and is unwilling to abandon or to do without, now listen, a cheerful, joyous, prompt-to-do-it giver whose heart is in his giving. 
So God's saying, I not only want you to give, but I want you to give with a good attitude and with a smile on your face. And you know, remember that wherever you give, you're still giving it to God. You're practicing a biblical principle that God tells you to practice. And the Bible says that God is able then, through your giving, through your faithfulness in giving, God is able to make all grace, every favor, every earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you may always and under all circumstances of whatever the need be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. And then it actually goes on to just say some other really wonderful things that as you continue to give, then God will keep giving back to you and then you can give and God will keep giving back to you and you, you'll just be able to just keep helping people and keep helping people. It's really great to get a good flow going in your life. So just make a decision today that you're never going to be a reservoir. You're not just going to be a collection station for everything that you can get in life, but you're going to understand that God wants to get something to you and then through you. And then it comes full circle, more comes back to you, and then more should go out through you. So I'm just really trying to follow what I felt like God put in my heart and teach you the importance of giving. Now we're going to go right into our teaching from the conference and learn how we can imitate God's giving. Enjoy the teaching today. Psalm 37, this has really been good for me, and I hope that you can get this today. I take people to this a lot. Psalm 37, we're going to look at one through uh, five. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. <laughs> Neither be envious against those who work unrighteousness. You know, sometimes people are hurting you, and it actually seems that their circumstances are better than yours. And isn't that a flesh burner? <laughs> it's like, well, God... I'm trying to do what's right, and you're telling me to wait on you, and here they are acting like a jerk, and they're the ones getting the raises and not losing their jobs, and look at what's happening to me. But you know, instead of saying that, you should say, God is on my case, and I've got a double reward coming. Yeah. Learn how to say what you want, not what you got. Fret not yourself because of evildoers, neither be envious against those who work unrighteousness, that which is not upright or in right standing with God. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust, lean on, rely on, and be confident in the Lord and what? Yeah. And what? Yeah. What? Yeah. When? So shall you dwell in the land and feed surely on his faithfulness, and truly you shall be fed. You know, even when somebody hurts your flesh or they hurt your feelings, if you will handle things God's way, in the midst of that, you will be fed. Inside, you will be fed. Like David said in Psalm 23, Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And then he talks about right in the midst of his enemies being fed, how his cup runs over. And he's celebrating right, right when all the stuff is going on. You know why? If you're happy inside, then what's going on around you is not that important. Now I'm going to tell you a secret. Want no secret? We'll even tell the people watching by TV. Here's the secret. The better you treat people, the happier you're going to be. <laughs> it's so amazing. It's like sometimes I think, where have we been all these years that we've been Christians? It's like, how many more times are we going to have to do the Bible study on forgiveness before we get around to realizing that when you forgive somebody, you're doing yourself a favor? <laughs> Why should you waste your life being mad at somebody that's out having a good time and couldn't care less if you're upset? Come on, we got more smarts than that. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires and the secret petitions of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Roll and repose each care of your load on Him. Trust, lean on, rely on, and be confident in Him. And He will what? Bring it to pass. So, 
We're going to trust in the Lord and do good. Now, we do not have nearly enough Christians that are working for justice. It's unjust to see kids living in a trash dump. If you saw that presentation we did a while ago on our video screens, and I know those watching by TV didn't get to see it, but we were showing a trash dump in Cambodia where 3,000 people live. They live. And after dark, when the trash trucks back up to that dump, to unload the city garbage. These kids are waiting to get in that mess, hoping to be one of the first ones to find something that they can sell the next day to get enough to live on. Now, I don't even know how to think about it. I don't know, you, you can't justify that. There's nothing right about that. That is the most unjust thing that I could imagine that a child, four and five and six years old, has to spend seven days a week digging through garbage and trash looking for enough to eat. So I can't just say that's a shame. Somebody needs to do something. <laughs> you say, well, I don't know what to do. You start praying, God will show you. Wait, what can I do? Well, if nothing else, you can support somebody else that's doing something. Come on, don't get too excited. A co-worker, his car was totaled. She owed more on it than what she got from the insurance company. So now she still has to make payments on this car and she can't afford to buy another one. So. She's taking public transportation to work every day, which of course is, you know, that's not the worst thing in the world that can happen to you, but you know, in the winter it's cold, and the rain it's wet, <laughs> and the ice it's slick. If you're in San Antonio in the summer, it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're the, you're the co-worker, you know about her situation, and this little thought comes to you, well, you know, I guess I could maybe offer to pick her up and take her home every day till she gets over this situation. Then this, then this little, see, you don't know it, but you got this little red guy sitting on your shoulder. <laughs> got this little demon that's assigned to you to keep you out of the will of God. And he does it by planting thoughts in your head. So here you're thinking, well, you know, I, 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 I could help her with that situation. Now, you know, and so then this little voice says, well, yeah, but that's three miles out of your way. That's six miles a day round trip. Well, God forbid that we would be inconvenienced to help anybody. <laughs> Did you hear me? <laughs> we certainly wouldn't want it to be inconvenient. We wouldn't want it to cost us anything or require any sacrifice or make us have to get up 10 minutes earlier. Or... <laughs> Come on, you might as well just eat this because I ain't going to shut up. <laughs> One way or the other, it's going to slide down your throat. <laughs> I cannot stand to hear Christians say, I just wish God would show me what my ministry is. <laughs> I've listened to Christians do that for 33 years. I just wish I knew my purpose. I wish God would show me what my ministry is. I don't know what my gift is. I don't know what I'm called to do. <laughs> well, open your eyes and your ears and start looking and listening and start imitating God. Let the ideal servant of the Lord be reproduced in you. Be his hands, be his feet, be his eyes, be his mouth. This is not hard. If you were the one riding the bus, what would you want somebody to do for you? Pick you up, that's right. Pick you up and take you home. And, and so then this little voice says, well, you know, you don't even like her. <laughs> well, cool, that makes it all the better. And it's really good if it's somebody who's mistreated you. Now we're getting over into the God kind of stuff. 
Now we're getting over into that acting like God kind of thing. Who lets the sun shine on the just and the unjust. Amen? I bet you when God asked Dave and I to move my parents from where they lived in southeast Missouri to our city and take care of them until they died. And God gave us the grace to do it, which was not easy because there was nothing in the natural that made me want to do that. I'm telling you the truth. I mean, you know, you don't want to help people that abused you. But I'll bet you the day that we bought them that house and moved them into it, I'll bet you hell shook. Come on now. If you've got a, a mom or a dad that you haven't even talked to in three months, that's not right. Well, you don't know what they did to me. Still not right. The Bible doesn't say that you just treat people right who deserve it. Oh, we'll get around to mercy tomorrow. You just better buckle your seatbelt. Because <laughs> mercy is the stuff you give people that don't deserve it. Uh-oh. <laughs> Now, come on, don't be a coward and stay home tomorrow. <laughs> Let's look at Jeremiah 22. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's services without wages and does not give him his pay for his work. Now, I just wanted to say a word to anybody watching by TV or anybody here in the room, or if you're listening by radio later on or DVD or CD or all these wonderful forms of being able to get the word. If you are a, own a business, if you're a boss, if you're a supervisor, if you have people working for you in any way, shape, or form, and you take advantage of them, You don't pay people the least amount you can pay them and get by with it. You don't only give them increases when they threaten to quit if you don't. We took a step as a ministry several years ago, and it was very costly. But we started really feeling bad for a lot of the single moms that work for us that could not afford health insurance, because at that time we paid for the employee but not their family. And... Um, so we just, made a, we just made a decision as, a, as an act of faith and as an act of giving that we would start giving everybody full family insurance. Well, when you're talking about full family insurance, I mean, you're talking, uh, you don't even want to know the numbers. I mean, it's, you know what your insurance costs, so you multiply that times 900 and it goes off into infinity somewhere. I mean, it's like, and so, you know, you think, how in the world can we do that? You know what? Treating people right is one of the reasons why you get blessed. When you mistreat people, you're not going to have the blessings of God on your life. <laughs> Come on. Now, a lot of you think, I got by with that one because I'm nobody's boss. Well, <laughs> sooner or later, you'll be in a position where you have authority to do or not do something. And if you want to be a person who represents God's justice, then you're not going to do what you can get by with. You're going to do the best thing that you can possibly do. And you're going to do unto them what you would want done unto you if it was you. Yeah. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness. You know, if I have to build a big company by mistreating other people, then the Bible says, woe to me. I don't know what that is, but I don't want any of it. <laughs> Verse 14, who says, I will build myself a wide house with large rooms, and he cuts himself out windows, and it is sealing or paneled with cedar and painted with vermilion. Do you, I love this, do you think that being a king, 
Do you think that being the boss or being the one in charge or being the top dog or the head guy or even the parent gives you a right to mistreat other people and to live a self-indulgent life while they do without? <laughs> Come on. Somebody needs to start treating their employees better. Now, a lot of you like this because you think, yeah, my boss needs to treat me better. I'm going to get him a copy of this CD. <laughs> but if you want God to do that for you, then you need to start treating somebody else better. Even if it's your dog, you've got authority over somebody. Start treating them better. Do you think that being a king merely means self-indulgent vying with Solomon and striving to excel in cedar palaces? Did not your father Josiah, as he ate and drank, do justice and righteousness, being upright and in right standing with God? Then it was well with him. <laughs> then it was well with him. You want your business to prosper? You treat your employees right. Come on. That needed to be said. You want your house to prosper? You treat your kids right. You treat them with respect. Just because they're children doesn't mean they don't deserve respect. The Bible says if you hurt one of these little ones, it would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the depths of the sea. Ooh. Honor your father and mother that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Come on, you better start calling mom and dad and seeing how they're doing. Come on, get that lazy flesh kicked up into a new gear. When you do what's right, when it feels wrong, that's when you're making spiritual progress. God is the God of justice. Yes, God, bring justice into my life. But it's to you and through you. To you and through you. While you're waiting for God, which you have the power to do, say, I have the power to wait. <laughs> say it again, I have the power to wait. I think maybe one more time you'll convince yourself, I have the power to wait. While you're waiting on God to bring recompense and vengeance, while you're waiting on God, you need to stay busy doing what? Good. When? You know, you're pretty smart here in San Antonio. And then these verses end by saying, those who know God will treat other people fairly. Those who know their God, those who have a revelation of God's nature will be afraid to mistreat people. We need to have a reverential fear and awe of mistreating people. And anytime that you think you've hurt anybody, the best thing in the world that you can do is go back and humble yourself and say, I am sorry I talked to you that way. I am sorry I acted that way. I'm sorry I didn't treat you the way that you should have been treated because God takes it personally when we mistreat his children. Amen. Come on, smile real big. All right, you can get up. Woo, hallelujah. I can feel you growing. Are you growing? Well, the bottom line of what we want you to take away from this program today is that the better you treat people, the happier you're going to be. I love Psalm 37, three, it says, trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. When you have a problem, what do you wanna do? Number one, trust in the Lord. Number two, do good. So shall you dwell in the land and feed surely on his faithfulness and truly you shall be fed.